Let's get started. My name is Andrzej Bednarz, and I will talk to you about clean architecture. And just a short uh, reminder, here uh, in your printed schedule, here should be Robert, but he had some troubles with flight, so that's why we have now uh, my presentation. Okay, uh, as a little warm-up, uh, how many of you use already clean architecture in your projects? Could you raise your hands? Okay, not many people. How many of you uh, know something about clean architecture? Okay, but I think less than half uh, of you. So, um, okay, that's fine. Uh, I hope that uh, this presentation won't be, uh, will give something new to you, even if you already heard something about clean architecture. Okay, so at the beginning, a few words about me. I work currently, I, I am in, the, uh, in this industry in software development for a little more than 10 years now. Uh, currently I work for Network Assets. Uh, this is uh, a company based in Wrocław and Berlin where we develop uh, very interesting stuff for uh, large uh, networks mainly, backend uh, th systems. Um, for most of my career I was uh, involved in uh, Java, JVM projects and uh, I'm a big fan of Agile approach, not only to uh, leading projects, but also to how um, the company can uh, run, um, how the whole company can be organized around Agile principles. I'm a big fan of it, and uh, since I also value uh, very much uh, the way how we develop software, I care about uh, how we develop software, I want it to be uh, good, whatever that means, and that's why uh, Software Craftsmanship uh, Manifesto uh, is here, so well-crafted software. Um, and, uh, um, all, and all the things that come from that. Okay, um, so some time ago we started a new project and uh, we wanted to make that project uh, this time uh, successful, this time we wanted to make that project good. Uh, I'm sure all of you uh, have been in such a uh, project that uh, was not very pleasant to work in, that you wanted to quit, that you wanted, uh, that you were uh, bored or uh, you were angry because even simple things require a lot of development and uh, the whole thing is not stable. So I, I also experienced that and uh, when we started uh, something new, I really wanted to make it uh, in such a way that everybody would like to join, everybody uh, uh, would like to be in this project and they will have fun from uh, uh, developing. And um, there are many ways uh, how you can start your project and uh, how you can design it and so on and so forth. Um, but at the beginning we tried to come up with some basic uh, gu guidelines, some main principles around which we wanted to build uh, the rest. So uh, these gu guidelines were, firstly, we wanted to be able to uh, develop fast. Well, uh, if even simple thing, if, if you need uh, a lot of work to make even a simple thing, so that's uh, annoying, that's frustrating. So we want to be able to develop fast. And that's not only from developer's point of view, that, uh, that's also from business point of view. Uh, when you are second on the market, then probably you are too late, right? So that fast development is really crucial. Um, the second thing is uh, no fear to change. Uh, there is a, a, a uh, quite popular, I think, uh, saying that if it works, don't change it. Uh, such a, a rule in many projects, I think. Uh, but we wanted to be in a position where we can change anything. If you can change, then you can improve, then you can refactor, uh, then you can uh, make things better, then you can innovate, and so on and so forth. So that uh, need to be able to change uh, is really crucial. And from these two rules, uh, then, we, uh, then we come up with uh, some following uh, some following principles, but these are the main which, uh, which drove our uh, design. But, uh, okay, so we know we want to be fast and we want to be able to change, but how? Um, 
like we had uh, a talk of uh, Hadi, there are many different approaches, there are many different, uh, mm, let's say, uh, things that are popular currently and which quite frequently change. Um, but uh, in, uh, in such a uh, look for uh, something that we could use at, at the, as a basis of our design, uh, we found uh, this guy. Uh, do you know who that is? Anybody? Okay, I heard already Uncle Bob, yes. So he is a famous writer, of course, and uh, uh, he wrote uh, the most important, uh, the most uh, famous, I think, uh, his work is Clean Code, but he also uh, talks about clean architecture for some time. And uh, what he says about clean architecture? So, firstly, he says that uh, the only way to go fast is to go well. Uh, that's uh, quite uh, uh, opening, eyes opening, because there is still a debate. I think uh, uh, it's not that controversial, but uh, there is still a debate. I experience that still. Uh, for instance, uh, people say that we do not write tests. Why you do not write tests? Because uh, they slow us down. And here the principle is tests uh, won't slow you down. I mean, if you want to go well, uh, if you want to go fast, you need to go well. So that, that uh, changes a little how we, uh, how we um, come to software development. But uh, more specific about clean architecture is, uh, is as follows. First thing, uh, he says that architecture is not about tools or frameworks. Um, Instead, it should scream, it should say, it should show, but he even says screams intended usage. So when you take a look on your architecture, on your project architecture, it should, it should say exactly what the system does. You shouldn't be forced to uh, go deeper into internals of the system. You should see it right from the outer view. So screaming architecture. Uh, secondly, your architecture should allow to defer and even change decisions about uh, such things as UI, uh, database, uh, various frameworks and tools that we are using in the project. So yeah, in, other words, in other words, we shouldn't be strongly coupled to the things. Uh, we should be able to change them and, uh, and introduce late in the projects. Uh, the same applies even to dependency injection framework. And sometimes this is heart of our application, right? For instance, with Spring Framework, this is often um, heart of our application. Here, sh it should be uh, not in the central part. Even Uncle Bob calls uh, these things UI database a detail. Uh, very important sometimes because database can be crucial for us and can have a large influence on, uh, for instance, performance. But this is still a detail. I'll go deeper into that in a second. Um, he says also, Uncle Bob, that architecture should be decoupled, uh, which means that we should keep uh, various components which have, uh, which have different responsibilities, we should keep them separate. Uh, this is the same as hexagonal architecture, other name is plugin architecture, so your plugin, for instance, uh, you can write new plugin for uh, database access, so change from, I don't know, one to another d database. Uh, our hexagonal architecture, this is known from uh, Cobborn. And uh, last thing, it's testable. Uh, your architecture should facilitate testing. If your architecture uh, doesn't allow to uh, write tests, and good tests, fast tests, then it is uh, something not right. It could lead to TDD, but TDD is not obligatory. And uh, that's all what I have uh, directly from uh, Uncle Bob and his principles. He has great presentations online. I encourage you to see it. There are many of them, even from uh, when he visited last year Wrocław, there is something on, uh, on YouTube from that presentation. So he talks more about why all these principles are important and um, why we should uh, take care of them. I, uh, on my presentation, would like to uh, show you how uh, we interpreted that uh, principles in our application and, uh, and uh, what comes out of it. So firstly, screaming architecture. Uh, so top-level visibility should be uh, what the system does. Uh, 
what the system does, these are modules and functionalities. You should be able to uh, write from the beginning, just simply browsing the code, quickly see what the system is doing. Uh, what we have instead, uh, we often have instead uh, as the first uh, level citizens, frameworks and tools. For instance, if we are doing Spring MVC application, then our main packages in the project um, are a model view controller. Or nowadays, uh, Akka. Uh, uh, we also started in our company last year project in, with Akka, and uh, the first version of it was that Akka was in, in the main, main part of it. But from a uh, clean architecture point of view, Akka is just a, just a tool, just, just a detail to prov provide some functionalities, to provide some services in the system. Uh, we can think about uh, that architecture um, as, a, um, as how we take a look on architecture uh, from uh, uh, construction, from the uh, when we when we design buildings, right? So here we see an, uh, a schema uh, um, of a flat, and uh, here are no details about what bricks we use or what the walls are built from, right? But uh, we see already from that uh, high-level overview uh, what we have in such a building. The same applies, for instance, to church. Think about it if you see a. Uh, schema and architectural diagram of a church, you already see that this is actually a church, right? Uh, the same for library, for instance, or whatever. So uh, how we did that? Let's have a look on, a, uh, on our demo. I have a project on GitHub, so you can easily find it. Um, just if you type my name and clean architecture, uh, it, it will be um, uh, accessible. Okay, so... Uh, what do we have in the uh, main folders of, uh, of our source? Right, so uh, when I open uh, the first level of, of uh, my project, I see some modules. Here we see charging product, event type rate, tariff plan, so probably this is uh, when someone already uh, knows a little the domain, he knows this is uh, a kind of charging uh, system, where we, which we could configure, which we could uh, read about. Uh, so let's uh, have a look on one of these modules. Uh, so for instance, event types. Uh, we see three packages. Um, and uh, we see that uh, core functionalities are in the first package. Let's open it. And already at the beginning, we see uh, two classes, get all event types and import event types. So it's easily visible. We don't see here a model view controller or, uh, I don't know, ACA. We see modules and main functionalities which are in these modules, right? So uh, here are get all event types, import event types, so let, let's open something else, like tariff plans. Okay, we see here activate tariff plan. So this directly uh, shows us, even without looking into details, just looking into packages and main classes, uh, what the main functionalities are. But let's move on, what's clean architecture? Here is a basic uh, schema. In, uh, as the central part of the application is application core. Uh, we also see two other components. One on the left side is delivery mechanism. That's the way how we expose our application to the external world. We use that delivery mechanism and this could be whatever. It could be REST services, it could be uh, web services, it could be console application or a desktop application, whatever. That all sits here in the delivery mechanism. But our application, in order to run, needs some external services. Here, here they are called gateways. And these uh, gateways, this is, for instance, database, or external REST service which we require to run our application. What's important here? The most important thing is uh, the arrow, which points into application core. And this is not flow of events. This is dependency source code dependency. So we see that both delivery mechanism and gateway depend on application core. Application core is a place where we have business logic. Here is um, the essence of our system. I mean, what database we are using, which is in gateway, how we expose our application, these are details. These are uh, in the outer uh, place, in the outer space, right? And uh, what's the most important is our application core. That's uh, that's the specificity of our system. And that application code do not depend on any external mechanism. How is that possible? 
let's uh, have a look on uh, more details. Firstly, application core, the most important thing. So we have uh, two types of things here. Uh, one is interactor, and uh, second are entities. Uh, what are these entities? Uh, these are not hibernate entities. These are not uh, data structures, which we return to the delivery mechanism. These are the core of our application. This is domain-driven design entities, uh, so various poli politics, um, strategies, uh, reach entities, which define our business logic. So if you are on a if you try to learn domain-driven design and wonder how to structure applications, so this is the place where you put domain-driven entities. And there is uh, one other thing, Interactor, uh, that uh, orchestrates these entities. This is an entry point to your domain model. Uh, what's an Interactor? That's um, the name Interactor was invented by, was given by Uncle Bob. Uh, in other works, this is called uh, also use case, sometimes a controller. But in order to uh, avoid confusion with the other terms, Uncle Bob call it, uh, call, calls it Interactor. Uh, well, basically, Interactor is a script of our functionality. Here we see an example of uh, creating order. And uh, it comes directly from uh, requirements. And so we, hit that, that we see here that uh, we create an order, and our system um, processes it and returns results or errors. Right, so um, this is from business perspective, this is from end user perspective, and our interactor should be able to implement that. How do we call an interactor? Well, uh, we need to call an interactor from the external world, from uh, delivery mechanism. We see here on this diagram a controller class, which is such a, uh, such a um, member of external world. So for instance, this could be a REST controller. It calls our interactor via interface in order to, to avoid uh, tight coupling between REST controller and interactor. And of course, some request model is passed from controller to um, interactor. This request model, uh, please note, is a member of uh, application core. Not, uh, uh, it is not part of uh, REST controller world. So we are not passing here any HTTP session, parameters, or whatever. These are all. Uh, transform into uh, independent from framework request model. So he could be, for instance, I don't know, filtering or paging parameters. Okay, so it is pretty basic and I think uh, quite uh, common to other systems, but what, when it gets interesting is how uh, we return results from Interactor. Um, we have here, uh, uh, we have here a presenter and uh, our interactor, in order to return results, uses that presenter. Um, of course, interactor returns a response model. The response model is, um, uh, for instance, a list of orders or a list of, uh, list of other um, uh, things that we want to show on a web page. But, uh, uh, but how we pass this, uh, uh, this data is via presenter. Our interactor should be independent of the REST controller, right, and of the presenter. So how, how do we achieve that? We want to call a thing like, I don't know, display result or display error message. And how interactor can call it on a presenter? How is that possible uh, without direct, uh, directly depending on presenter? Do you know maybe that pattern? Anybody knows that pattern? Yes? What's it? Do you, can you name that pattern? <laughs> What's the, uh, how this mechanism is called? If you do not directly call a method from presenter, instead you introduce an interface, and that interface is called from... Yes, dependency inversion, yep. So this is a technique that we use here in order to avoid a direct dependency from interactor on presenter. Okay, and how we call infrastructure services? Uh, we use similar technique. So we don't want our interactor to depend directly on database. So we create an interface, here it is called Entity Gateway, which is implemented by a, a implementation. So for instance, we could have here a, a order a repository 
something like that. And here it is implemented by JPA repository or no, no SQL repository, which uses directly database API. Thanks to that, we are not dependent on underlying services. And uh, all the things uh, together uh, on one uh, picture. So uh, let me uh, show you a quick flow. The dependencies we already know, they are always point inwards into the in core of the application, but the flow uh, goes as follows. From controller, we uh, start a request, which, uh, which, is, uh, which calls a service, uh, an, an interactor, through an interface. It passes request model, then the interactor takes something from a database using dependency inversion uh, technique, uh, create, uh, makes some operation on entities, and returns results, uh, results via a presenter. Okay, so that's an enough diagram for today. Let's have a look on a demo. Okay, so uh, let's start from uh, delivery mechanism. We have uh, REST API here implemented. Uh, let's have a look on something uh, simple. Firstly, get all event types. Um, right, so here I use uh, Spring MVC. So here are uh, details, uh, framework details. These uh, annotations come from Spring, and uh, we specify here get methods and so on and so forth. But the only thing that uh, our con REST controller is doing is it uh, executes a business method, which is get all event types command. It needs to pass a presenter, which is able to display results to the user, and also request model. And then we just simply execute uh, that business method. Okay, so let's have a look on uh, the business implementation on our interactor. This is get all event types. Please uh, note firstly that uh, I will maybe uh, show the imports. So uh, please note that here is no dependency on actual uh, database. Here is no dependency on any detail coming from HTTP side. So we only depend here on uh, the core module. For instance, if you want to uh, take um, events from a database, we use an interface, which is event type list, uh, event types finder. And that interface is in, in our core package in, in Boundary. And that needs to be implemented by something, of course, in order to run. But the main point here is that we uh, do not depend directly on a database. So, and some business operations are happening, and then we say uh, to presenter that uh, a result should be shown or error message should be shown. We even distinguish between two different types of errors. So uh, one, one, is, uh, one is client side, one is server side. Uh, so we can distinguish that. Uh, and this presenter needs to be implemented on the delivery mechanism side, right? So the same would apply for console application, for desktop application. If we want to display results, it needs to be implemented on, on delivery mechanism side. And thanks to using presenter, we know which functions need to be implemented. Here are, uh, here are three, send, uh, send or show results and uh, two for different error types. Okay, so it's clearly visible uh, what's, uh, what needs to be implemented on delivery mechanism side. And uh, our business logic uh, is independent of the underlying uh, frameworks. Um, maybe it's, uh, it's a good time to show you also some tests, because I mentioned that also that tests are very important. Um, thanks to uh, such a uh, division of modules, division of classes, we can easily write tests which are independent of your web framework, of your uh, web server, which are independent of database. Uh, we can easily focus on business logic uh, testing, and uh, these tests will be fast. Do you know how uh, fast should be tests, should run tests, according to Uncle Bob? Anybody? Yeah, they should be very fast. He says even they should run like this. So around, around a second or so. So let's try my test. Um, OK. Let's see how long it takes. It took uh, over one second. So that's not, uh, not that good, but let's see why. 
Um, here I have a, a bunch of testing. There, of course, the number is uh, very little, just uh, to show you examples, but um, the most uh, interesting tests are here. So for uh, business logic testing, I've got only here that, that one test suite, and uh, they are independent of database and web frameworks and so on and so forth, and let's see how fast they run. And we see that it took uh, uh, not much, N not even a quarter of a, uh, well, a little over a quarter of a second. And uh, we have here all the uh, business logic testing. So uh, we execute a command and uh, we, we check if everything what's expected has happened. We don't even have to, with such architecture, we don't even have to use any mocking framework. Uh, sometimes configuring mocking framework is uh, cumbersome, it may be difficult, we might need something more than mocking frameworks provides. With such architecture, it's very easy to define your own mocks or stubs. So if we want, for instance, to return uh, two items from a database, we simply create, uh, implement a new, uh, we implement, we, uh, we define new implementation of um, our interface event types finder, right? And we simply return a list. Of course, with mocking framework, this is also uh, achievable, but here we have more power. We can implement whatever. Okay, and uh, my tests also covered uh, something more. Let me run them once again. We also tested here, um, I also, I also show here how we could test uh, HTTP part. So I have here, I start here a Spring uh, container using uh, Spring tool for testing HTTP requests. This is uh, mock MVC. And uh, here we simply test if uh, proper format of JSON response is returned. This is also fast uh, because we do not run uh, database queries and so on and so forth. We just simply test that REST controller. Of course, we can create here also in, in similar way, uh, simple stubs which return all uh, desired results. And that also is very fast. Even though we start a Spring container, so it takes a second or so to run the, uh, these tests. Okay. So that's uh, the basic presentation. You can uh, dig dive into source code, uh, just uh, take a look on my GitHub. Maybe just uh, one more thing, the infrastructure. So we have here uh, different uh, application services implemented, right? So for instance, repository, we have JPA or external REST services. We could take data from these two places or notification or whatever. Um, maybe I will also show you some more complicated for a second, some more complicated controller. Here is uh, import event types, uh, business uh, uh, business interactor, and here in method execute we have uh, more things. We have notification to administrator, but this is still only calling an interface, which is somehow Im implemented. Uh, we have persistence, we have some business functions calling from entities. Okay, so uh, let's go back to our presentation. So we use that framework, that's um, uh, the code that I showed you a little resemble, well, more or less re uh, sh resembles what we did in a uh, real project and what issues uh, did we have? Well, um, there are a couple of them, but before that, uh, let me show you uh, just to build uh, your, uh, how you feel the architecture, just one more thing about uh, layers. How do we uh, traditionally show systems and, uh, and uh, how the layers look like? It's usually like this. So you have a UI, which depends on business logic, and that business logic depends on various services. With clean architecture, we have something different, because business logic and domain model do not depend on anything, but the, all the other stuff depends on them. Right, that we can see from here, for instance, that plugin architecture. Uh, and this uh, drawing, this uh, showing layers in, such a, in, in a stack doesn't look good, so uh, instead of this, we use uh, that kind of diagram. That comes from Uncle Bob originally, and it shows the same idea. So no layers, but uh, uh, circles. <laughs> 
it shows the basic idea. So dependency comes from uh, outer in, into uh, center of the picture, and uh, yeah, and all the services are, are implemented uh, are, are implemented uh, on the outer side. Okay. So what are the results of our findings? Well, uh, there are some. Uh, there are some disadvantage, disadvantages of this approach. Maybe someone can name anything? What's your impression? What, are, what the disadvantages could be? A lot of abstraction. A lot of, abstraction. A, a lot of additional abstraction, right? Anything else? Okay, so let's go. A lot of additional code, classes and interfaces. So. We, we cannot directly call a dat database, right? So we need to create an interface for that. Um, also, I don't know, presenter, this is something new. Usually we just return results from our uh, service layer, right? Yes, so there is uh, a bunch of files which we need to create additionally. Uh, second thing, yeah, so uh, around half of these uh, classes or interfaces are uh, could be simply removed in another approach. Um, second thing, which is uh, uh, which was quite big pain for us, and uh, and actually everybody who joined the project uh, asked about that. The, uh, these are additional DTOs and conversions. So uh, since we want to have our core, our business core, to be independent of any external services, then uh, there is, um, we need to create um, additional uh, data structures. We cannot pass our rich entities, our core domain model, we cannot pass that to um, delivery mechanism, because we don't want them to call or calculate something. We, we simply send, to delivery mechanism, we simply send a data structure, which should be displayed, nothing more. And about database here, we also uh, do not want to have database details in our domain model, in our domain-driven design model, right? So in entities, we cannot have hibernate annotations because that requires us to have database uh, details inside. Um, so uh, in the worst case, we could have, uh, let me count. So firstly, here we have a separate set of uh, data structures then entities, and we need conversion between them, so there are two already. And then we create a response model, so this is again a DTO, uh, which we create from entity. We do not want to pass our rich entity. And uh, thirdly, on the presenter side, we also need to have something which we show to the external world, right? So for instance, even with REST services, REST controller, uh, we pass a simple D uh, DTO from our interactor, and uh, our resource, which we expose via REST, needs to have some additional things like links, for instance, or uh, some uh, details which depend, uh, which come from protocol that we use for presenting our application, right? So uh, we could have, I don't know, instead of one entity that we have in a coupled application, in a big ball of math application, we have here four and uh, a couple of conversions between them. And that, of course, in involves, involves cost. Um, and this is still a field of uh, discussion in, in industry. For instance, one year ago, there was a very interesting um, talk between uh, Martin Fowler, Kent Beck, and uh, David Heinemeyer Hanson. He is called DHH, he's author of the Rails framework, and he complained about that approach, about clean architecture clean architecture approach or about hexagonal architecture approach, or it is also called um, TDD approach. He says that, uh, that that guy, DHH, says that uh, this approach, putting tests as, as, a, as a most important thing, uh, destroys uh, design. And he gives such an example. If we have a race controller, which simply saves a new employee, or display uh, and display a, f a form for uh, entering employee details takes uh, as many lines as we he see here, so around 10 lines of code. That's what we have from uh, Rails framework, right? 
And uh, if you want to apply the patterns and all the techniques that I showed you in, the, in my uh, presentation, then it turns into something like this. So we have here 60 lines of code. That's how you can do it. That's, uh, that's how you do it in uh, Rails. It's decoupling from Rails. <laughs> yeah, and it's a good question if it's worth it, right? So compare this uh, 10 lines of code to this 60, right? So there's certainly a cost involved, cost involved in that approach. So why do we want to do that? Why, why did we do that? Well, uh, firstly about Rails. Um, so I found, uh, I, found on inter uh, I found from my friends from the Rails community that even they, are, uh, they have some issues with the Rails way. So yes, it's fun coding in Rails. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it takes not that much code, but uh, it soon became uh, troublesome. So they even say uh, that coding Rails is fun for the, for the first three months. After some time, uh, you start to get a mess. So uh, that simple controller that I showed you, 10 lines of code, is, uh, is um, uh, rarely the case. Usually, controller turn into that. And here we see uh, a lot of code. That's a Rails controller also. And uh, here are mixed various things. Here are mixed issues which come from database. Here are mixed some issues which come from the HTTP protocol and REST services. So everything is mixed here. And if we go such an approach that we want to, uh, to create, um, that, we want to go to, uh, that we want to go along that uh, Rails way, that short way, then uh, it may become troublesome. And of course, uh, I'm not saying that Rails is a bad framework. It's, uh, it has its usage. It is very useful for many things, and uh, it's very successful. You can also do in Rails uh, things well. So uh, mm, I'm not complaining about Rails. I'm just showing uh, uh, how uh, it could become bad if you use that, uh, and if you use that in, in, uh, in, uh, in such a way. Okay, so uh, this uh, uh, that answers a little to, to the question if uh, if creating too many classes is something bad. Well, it depends. I will come back to that question at the end. Uh, but uh, what we have uh, the best things from clean architecture that we experienced and that I can uh, be sure that the clean architecture brings. So first is excellent testability. Uh, really, every component and every layer could be tested in isolation. I showed you also that a little in my test. So business logic can be tested in isolation, and tests are that fast, right? Because you do not depend on anything. Um, you can also test uh, REST controllers. You can test uh, database uh, separately. So uh, we had tests in our project, and I think it was a very good achievement for uh, every business functionality. And uh, of course, we also had integration tests, which come, which go through the whole stack, the complete stack. But uh, thanks to these fast tests, we are able to find uh, issues fast. Um, so tests are fast and uh, precise. They uh, identify the issues exactly where they, where they are. We do not have only one big integration test, which go through all layers, uh, up from REST controller to the database, down to the database. And if it fails, then we do not know what happens and on which layer the uh, error happened. We know it here very precisely. And that's what I call no fear to change. Uh, that's how we achieve that uh, value, no fear to change, with testability, with great amount of tests, with architecture that supports testing. Well, let's go more. Um, and also, clean architecture brings that value that, it is, that our system is easy to understand. It's easy to find what functionalities it uh, realizes. It's easy to find. And it's explicit by design. We have clear separation of concerns. We know where to look for, for cer certain type of issues. For instance, many people ask, uh, but how you do uh, validation? And uh, yeah. So thanks to that framework, thanks to clean architecture, we have clear indication where validation should go. If you are validating only details which are 
relevant to HTTP communication, we do that on REST controller level. If we validate business rules, we do that uh, in the application core. Database, we do that again only in that uh, entity gateway on that bottom level. And it is that database issues do not go into application core. And we are in, in full control of frameworks and tools. During lifetime of the project, we are able to change almost any, any, everything from uh, I don't know, Java version to different frameworks and tools, support uh, various databases, um, support various uh, external um, delivery mechanisms. So uh, it really uh, helped us to achieve that uh, control. We are not uh, fully applying all the uh, things here. For instance, we applied, uh, we used Spring Framework and we used Spring in the application core in order to, um, well, make use of it because it, it appeared to us that, uh, uh, that it gives us more value than cost. But uh, you can also get rid of Spring Framework in your application core, and I show that in, your, uh, in my GitHub. Okay, so thanks all of these things, we, have, we achieve in our system high maintainability and high flexibility. Um, and that, together with tests, leads to fast development. So that value from my first slides, fast development, is not about speed of typing, that you can achieve better with uh, frameworks like, like Rails or Grails. They are better if you, if, if you need to create a system and even, type, even speed of typing counts. So uh, clean architecture is certainly not for that kind of systems. But uh, fast development, if you need to maintain system in the long run, if you need to change it, if uh, frameworks change, if uh, different fashions like we have on Heidi, uh, um, presentation, what he showed, uh, that it changes all the time. So if you have a, an architecture that supports that, different fashions, different frameworks, then, uh, then I think clean architecture uh, can, can be very helpful. Um, but having said all, all that, DTOs and conversions are still, are still a pain. And uh, whoever joined our project, he was always complaining, but why the hell you are converting these DTOs and entities all over again. Um, in simple cases, it was like I said, for, uh, for data structures, for entities, and conversions between them, it was really cumbersome and it was a pain. And um, I asked that Uncle Bob, I had the opportunity to talk with him um, about that, and he said that um, maybe we could um, we could insert into our application a separate, uh, a separate uh, boundary for DTO. So we have on one side only DTO and all the system using that, and uh, we can do that at the beginning and afterwards clean that, clean that. Our way was to introduce some helping techniques, like I name here a uh, model mapper, which facilitates conversion between DTOs, uh, generic classes, and we also use Lombok. There is nice uh, annotation delegate which we used for uh, REST uh, resources. Uh, but generally, this is a problem. So Uncle Bob's suggestion, I also asked, I had an opportunity to talk to Greg Young on his workshop last year, and he said that the way to go is CQ, CQRS. Uh, do you know CQRS? What is it about? Anybody knows? Okay, not everyone, so just uh, in two words. It's an architecture. When, where you do not have one consistent uh, flow of uh, application um, control from presentation layer to infrastructure layer. This is not the same for reads and writes. In CQRS, you separate the way how you write something new when you update data and how you return data. And uh, thanks to that, you can simplify the way how you return data. So instead of writing a bunch of DTOs and conversions, you can f uh, f directly from um, REST controller or whatever presentation layer, you can make a query to database and fetch data and show that, um, and show that uh, on your um, external interface. OK, that, that's a very interesting concept, but we didn't use it yet. 
Okay, and the message uh, which I have to you is uh, to think about, uh, I want to uh, encourage you to think about what is fast and what is clean for you. I'm not saying that clean architecture is useful in every case, in every situation. Uh, it might happen that uh, clean architecture is not the best way. So let's uh, have a look on uh, such a configuration. Um, here, that's definitely not a clean architecture way. You just simply throw everything into one controller and you have... Uh, that might work for some configurations, I don't know, if you do not care what you have there and you never look back, right? So if you put everything into one place, that, that's fast, yes? Um, but if you want to look, uh, if you want to find something, if you want to understand it, what's there and what's inside, then that might be hard. So then uh, clean architecture might be the way for you. And here, of course, uh, fast. What is fast? Is it fast to have uh, uh, such a configuration where everything is ordered, everything is in place, where it requires something from you? It requires some engagement. It requires some thinking before, some planning, right? But at the end, uh, you, have, um, you have a configuration, you have a setup which you can uh, easily read, you can easily find, uh, you can easily, I don't know, sort or whatever. But for, some but for some cases, this might be not the proper way. For instance, if you make an application which you just want to show, you have just one week and you want to show some, someone, right? So maybe it's not worth to implement the full uh, stack of uh, clean architecture. Okay, this, uh, these ideas which I present to you, they are not new. They uh, go back to 1992, where Ivar Jakobson wrote his book about object-oriented use case driven design. Uh, these ideas you can find there. Um, many people from uh, that time uh, applied these techniques and these uh, approaches in various ways. For instance, Alistair Cockburn with his hexagonal architecture, I don't know, onion architecture back in 2008, uh, and Uncle Bob recently. So these are not new ideas. They are around from a long time. Uh, this is not homegrown. This comes from these uh, giants like Jacobson, Cockburn, Uncle Bob. Uh, this is not a rocket science. It's, it's really about the coupling, about thinking what's inside of your core application, what your business logic are, and they should be separated from all the external stuff. So uh, not a rocket science. It's not hard to implement. There's no framework. <laughs> uh, you can implement it by your own. And of course, it's not only Java related. You can uh, apply it in any language, any technology. We even tried in JavaScript uh, to some extent to implement it. Uh, and we can, uh, yeah, and we can see uh, already that some frameworks uh, are so uh, hard to use with clean architecture um, that maybe uh, we can be a little suspicious about that. For instance, uh, we didn't find a way to be uh, to apply clean architecture with Angular on the fr uh, front end side. Angular uh, wants to make s uh, want to be such inside of your application that it's really hard to abstract from it. Is it good? I don't know. Uh, Heidi already. Uh, moved back from uh, Angular to something else, React or something. Okay, so that's all. Uh, here are some references. They will be available online. Um, examples, there are a couple of them on the internet. And the first one is mine. And uh, thank you. If you have any questions, then please. Uh, do you have any questions, anybody? Yes? I will repeat the question. I'd like to ask about the drawback you said, uh, I mean, in too many converters between the abstraction. Uh, what, uh, how did you implement this, this part of the uh, architecture in your particular project? And do you have any ideas or suggestions for us? Okay, the question is about conversions, how we implemented that, conversions between uh, data structures, right? So we used a tool called Model Mapper. It, uh, uh, by default, it maps uh, fields that are named the same uh, between uh, objects, and it could be customized with different strategies and so on and so forth. This is not uh, the most performant uh, 
uh, tool that we could use, probably, but we didn't have such tight uh, requirements about performance. Okay, and more questions? Uh, the question is, uh, we use domain-driven design with rich entities and how it works with Spring, right? Well, Spring was used in that core domain uh, only for injection. Uh, so Interactor, for instance, uh, used some services like providers, right? And they were uh, injected by Spring framework. No, 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 no. We no, we didn't have uh, we didn't have business logic in uh, services. Well, uh, there there is a kind of business logic there because you need to decide uh, which method to call from entity, right? So that kind of business logic, the general business logic, orchestrating business logic. So, for instance, if we display uh, here in my example a list of events, there were two methods: uh, short event, uh, short event. Uh, form and, and detailed event form. And that interactor was deciding which to display when. So if we display all, event, all events, then it was taking that short form. It was calling that method return uh, short form of event. And if we go to the detail page, then interactor knew that he should call now uh, return detailed event. Right? So that interactor knew what to call. But uh, with Spring, we try to use as minimum in the core logic uh, as possible. It was actually used only for uh, dependency injection. OK, any more questions? What do you use that architecture with microservices? Because microservices should be small. So it's work to use that big architecture. I know that monolithic, monolithic system is OK, but for microservices, which have more responsibility and big architecture, I think. OK, the question is if it is uh, worth to use that big architecture with uh, microservices, which are small in nature. Well, um, I still do not understand exactly what is meant if someone says microservice, because sometimes uh, I saw such presentations where people show uh, we have microservice which returns uh, uh, time from the server, system current time mills. So definitely, if you want to have such functionality, it's not worth to use clean architecture. But if you understand microservices as uh, something a little bigger, like an aggregate root in domain-driven design, which means this is a, a little hierarchy of entities, then, uh, then I think it's worth it. So it's, if it's really simple, then probably not. But if, uh, it, uh, but if it involves some real uh, business logic, then I think it is worth it. Yes? What about uh, interdependence between different presenters? For example, when uh, you have a graphical interface, which can be one presenter, and you have a synchronous web service, which is a different presenter, they uh, operate on very uh, different principles. So isn't it limiting uh, that you need to support different kinds of presenters? Yeah, so the question is if uh, we have different types of presenter, if that influences uh, the business logic, right? Or other, way, or other presenters. Um, you want to support some functionality on the graphical user interface? Right. And in the, uh, at the same time, you have to support it on like a synchronous web, inter uh, web service, right? Right, right, okay. Well, sometimes you need to develop two business functionalities for that, probably. We didn't have such a case. So uh, I don't talk now about uh, experience from the project, but my speculations. So maybe sometimes you, you do need uh, two uh, methods for that. So one asynchronous, second uh, synchronous, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I want to uh, also point out that it's not always easy or even feasible to make abstractions which are always valid. So, for instance, if you develop your application as a, as a uh, normal SQL application using Oracle or whatever other database, and you want to turn that into event sourcing application, so where you store events 
and you do not have at all a database, right? You build from these events your uh, state. Then uh, probably uh, the abstraction that you developed at the first time uh, using, or, uh, using SQL uh, database uh, won't match. There will be some issues. But it doesn't mean it, it's not worth it because you have clear separation still. Even if you need to adjust these abstractions, you know what to adjust and you know where to look for, right? They don't have to be uh, universal for every kind of um, persistent mechanism, mechanism that you can think of, right? Or for instance, transactions are something that uh, can make a trouble. So with uh, SQL databases, it's different than NoSQL databases, right? And with SQL databases, you need to somehow start transaction on the business layer because business layer decides about uh, transactions. So it, uh, you do not have to provide 100% universal APIs and clearly abstract it because that would be, I think, too much upfront design. Okay, so thank you very much.